I've seen it. So I've got to be in the audience with you, Chris. Can you plug this in that socket? It is laid on the floor. I don't need it. Hello, everybody. I think we should begin. I think we have a full evening tonight. And I want to aloha you and thank you for coming. I'm Jim Albertini of Mamalina. And uh, I'm just going to be the MC. But uh, I really want to remind everybody to uh, help us uh, pass the word. There's some flyers on the table here. Uh, on Wednesday, from 3 to 4.30, we're having a stop for impact bombing protest at the airport Highway 11 intersection, right there in the grassy area on the Malka side. So if you can help pass the word on that, we, we've uh, written to DLNR, and it appears it's all clear to be able to protest that. We were there last Wednesday. So that's the one thing. And uh, we're open to future ideas. We had a protest at the docks. We had a protest at Wapalo on this forum. And uh, there's activities on several of the islands, so it's good. There's an increasing concern. I know there's gatherings. Last Saturday there was a march on Oahu and Pearl Harbor. A protest on Kauai. I'm not sure about now. But uh, the impact is certainly something every few years, every two years. Uh, it seems to increase the nature of it, the destructive nature uh, for the oceans, air, land, and sea, people, plants, and animals, I say. So uh, we're here tonight. We have a full program with, with uh, three great speakers: uh, Kayla Kishota, Lauren, Dr. Mann, and Tucker Harp. And we're going to start off in this order too. So uh, uh, we'll introduce Kayla Kishota, who's been a key figure in the Mauna Kea movement, and has uh, uh, been up to her eyeballs in the lawsuits with the Supreme Court. Uh, but she had been a cultural monitor at Kaupoloa, so her eyes have been on the Aina up there, too, as well as up in the Kea. So we're really glad to have her here. Uh, so please welcome Kea Aloha. Thank you, Kea.
so there was a lot of confusion for us as monitors to begin with. We're like, okay, well, at what point are we supposed to stop things when we, you know, it gets kind of bumpy? <laughs> um, but even even something as simple as hearing a police alert, I reported that in my daily logs, and um, they sent it back to me and said, you didn't see a police alert. And they said, well, actually, no, I didn't see one. I heard one. And they said, mm -hmm. No, you couldn't have. Because um, it's not where it's not their range and I know. Of course it's their range. We we fought the lawsuit over here, you know. We have the physical habitat, right? Protected. Of course it's their range. I'm like, what's the big deal? They're like, well you can't have any endangered species. And I said, Well listen, you, you are gonna have so this was the daily kind of struggle. We asked them, but actually every day was struggle like that. Um, but what we learned as monitors was that we can actually make a difference to the culture of the military uh, in, in, in a strange way. Like for example, we used to go up in our little corner every morning to Pule and pray. And by the time we were done, everyone was in the circle praying. Because we were praying, you know, when you pray, you pray for everyone. You can't say, oh, I'm only going to pray for our side, but not that side. <laughs> so, kind of we had to go with that, that, that play, uh, because it was very spir uh, high spiritual um, energy out there. And so, some of the places that we made headway were for example, asking the colonel and the later general to stop building the trees. Um, and they said, well, the trees aren't anything. And we said, well, yes, they are. They're in the body of our Kula. Without the trees, you change the weather pattern. The trees collect the water from the sky to deliver it to the water. So we, you know, we had that actual conversation and he was like, oh, okay, is that right? And we're like, yes, so can we have a global position that we just don't build those the tree? Um, that would be good. <laughs> He's like, okay, Ms. Gilla, we'll, we'll, can we have a global position, boys, not to do the tree? So we, we got them to actually recognize that. And then I got heat from the archaeologist and they said, no, no, this, that, and the other thing. But we just stayed on it. We just stayed on it. And um, so we ended up being able to, to make that change. Um, you know, I, I wasn't sure I, when my friend first said, Joe, uh, we come um, be a monitor. I said, where? And he said, walk I started laughing. I'm like, what are you kidding? I don't get along. I don't get along with the military. Probably not a good I said, go ahead, sign me up, they won't hire me. Well, and no. Uncle Pooh was on the cultural committee, and he was specifically arguing for Hawaiian monitors. And so it came right there, and uh, he always tells the story about how he said, absolutely, I trust Kelo Hustle. And that's how we got out there. Um, and so it was one of the deeper experiences that I've ever had because the every day I would ask a pool and you get dropped off in your section and you watch the bomb you know, or watch the bulldozer or you know, watch whatever you're watching. The guy's digging and watching. I would ask, what am I oh, well, why am I up here again? This is really hard to watch. But in the end, it's totally worth, I mean, it, maybe there's a health risk. There likely is. But the argument was, who will protect the kupuna if we don't? But who's the kupuna? Not just the ivy in the ground. The kupuna is the, the all the tree, the birds all of those things, 
once you start to see them, they then see you. And when that happens, um, <clears throat> it's also worth it to help raise the standard of the law on that life. Somebody said to me when I called and I said, I don't think I can do this. You're bombing like this, 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 and this. They bomb right when you're on the ground. So you know, and a lot of people don't really know this, right? But they come right in, like this, bomb the pool. Now the pools in the mountain regions are always places where he be in there. So that was a big one for us. Stop bombing the pools. That was another issue that we asked them to stop, mm -hmm. and I don't think they really do. Um, but we had to ask, and we should keep asking. Right? Um, the 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 feeling my friend said to me when you don't know what you're doing out there, tell them on. awaken the seeds so they'll grow. I said, well, what do you mean, awaken the seeds? He said, well, sing to them and awaken them. It's that kind of profound thing that saves you when they're coming down from the sky and just bombing you right in front of your eyes. Right? Maxine's case is very important. It's a beginning, not an end, but a beginning um, because all of the, the things that the monitors wrote became a part of his case, their case, mm -hmm. Maxine's case. And that's important because we recorded everything. Everything we saw, like we kept complaining all the time because we know they're using white phosphor. Say, are you using white phosphorus? We think you are because we can see it in the forest. Thank you so much. What, what it can do to humans, think what it's doing to the animals as well. I mean, and and in the court I remember them trying to say, they showed me a picture of all these ordinance. They said, kill them up. Do you recognize this picture? And I said, no. And they said, do you recognize this kind of ordinance? And I said, no, because I didn't take the picture. Another monitor probably took the picture. And they kept on me and on me. So finally I said, listen, if you're asking if this is what I, if I've seen this area, I can't say that I've seen that area. So let me just say this. All you see is what is in that picture. Everything. And then he was sorry to ask you that question. <laughs> But that's the truth of it. That's why we have unexploded ordnance specialists that have to take us everywhere. You know, and that was another thing. Why it's really good. A lot of them are retired military. And so at first they were like, oh, you're the, you know, Hawaiian, the tree huggers, you know, the tree huggers, the dolphin lovers. <laughs> And after a while, though, we spent all that time with them, we got to know each other. And we were so blessed to have them there. But also, it was hard for, for me to really think, like, this person is putting their life in order to keep my life. You know? And um, that's another aspect that I learned about the was which is hard because I'm, I'm just as hard as the next guy on why we're doing it, why we're doing any of it, why we spend so much money on it, why is war good, all of those things. But what, what did come through was that
that they have that two human side um, that's just like us. And so we made good, good friends, some of which we still talk to via Facebook and other things. And, um, and the, the tragedy of how young those people are that are being sent. You know, they told us that we couldn't talk to them or look at them. Ooh. And we were like, well, we're Kanakas. That's out the door. Aloha, <laughs> how are you? How are you doing, right? So at the end of the day, we did break that. <laughs> we broke that. But at the same time, we, we had to respect the fact that you, they need to survive wherever they're going. And in, in, in many cases, we were a big challenge. In fact, they used us to, um, for some of the training because they, they need to learn how to recognize um, <coughs> the enemy, I guess. <laughs> we're, we're of color. So we had that going on too. That was a very interesting thing. Boy, was that a great discussion we had. <laughs> About looking at the enemy, you know, um, othering others, right? But we too, as Kanaka, cannot other. So it was, <laughs> Aloha helps you understand how not to other the other. <laughs> but to love regardless of where they stand. But afterwards, some of the, when, um, I, I'm on the dolphin, or was on the dolphin rescue before I was being prosecuted. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, that's another story. But they all read the newspaper, and when the dolphin died, a number of those things came up in two ways and said, the story of the dolphin died. Because they knew that we were on the rescue. Spend 14 hours a day with people to learn a lot about them. But the main thing I want to say is that we have to still continue to stand for it. And it's not against anybody, it's standing for. You know, and someone got on my case actually and said, Well, go on, I'm, I'm for the innocent children. And I understand, I understand this. Well, aren't we all? I mean, really, I'd like somebody to say, who isn't for the innocent children being killed anymore? But to get through that point, to get past the point of you're a baby killer, how do we do that? <coughs> he actually said that I'm not a baby killer. I said, well, I'm not a terrorist. Can you get with that? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I, and then he said, I'm here, to, I have to talk to you. I'm like, okay, about what? <laughs> about what we're doing or not doing, right or wrong, or anything like that. So I actually got to lay it out for him. This is, we made a list. <laughs> we need to stop doing this, stop doing the trees, da 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 and then I told them, hey, your lease is going to be up soon, so you have to start cleaning up right now. And he, he didn't know that. And I said, well, listen, you better know that, because that's your language, that's your opinion. You have to clean this up and restore it to the way it was. That's the boilerplate language. All long-term leases have that. And he's like, really? He's like, and I'm like, yes. Of course you have to clean up. <coughs> Otherwise, and then he told me this. We can't clean it up. And I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, literally, in the old days, we used to be able to send guys out to clean up. Can't even know, it's too dangerous. No. Mm -hmm. Can you go lots? He said, no, it's raining. He said, well, all I know you have an agreement with the state. And here comes Antimax, in their case, exactly that. And they, they win. 
It's not a full win, but it's a major win. You know? And people always feel that you can't win against the big military. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that that isn't true. They said that about the TNT. And they also said that about us being prosecuted by Noah. But we're not done with that case yet. We're still, but I just wanted to add one of the things about what's happening is the dolphin rescue, which is also very rescue, is the large majority of the animals that we have rendered aid is during the mm. And what's happening right now, and I just want to share with you guys, is that um, the Navy has begun Section 106 consultation. Papa's involved, I'm involved. We all should be involved. And here's why. Because this sonar training that they're going to do goes from California all the way to the world. I mean, I went to testify, I was pretty emotional then, saying, hey, that is the direct route of our kind of law. Their migration route, the ancient route. I said, that's the ancient route of our own pathway. So they got to take from it. Okay, we're being prosecuted, by the way, by Noah, because we helped a whale. And then we buried it at sea in the traditional way, and they didn't give us permission. So they prosecute us. We've been going in the case, I think, six years? <laughs> no, no, it's only four years. My time. But they, the Navy, they, the Navy got a permit to kill, hurt, maim, or change the behavior of more than 10 million animals. So that could be endangered monkeys, dolphins, whales, turtles, sharks. over a five-year period. Now, ironically, we were, I was a, a witness in the Earth Justice case, and that's what caused this EIS to happen, what they're doing now. Because Earth Justice said, hey, listen, you can't, you can't do the thing, and that's just excessive. So what the court did was say, there are areas in the ocean, the Navy doesn't own the whole ocean, so there's areas that you need to look at because you also protect the nation, but you also have to protect the marine life and our oceans. So it's kind of this in-between litigation, but it was clearly a win because now we're in the environmental impact review study and also 106, 106 consultation under the National Historic Preservation Act. And that's where they must conduct things consultations with Native Hawaiians, when Native Hawaiians hold um, the area sacred or have religious attachment. So it's weird because normally it takes place on land, but in Hawaii, submerged land is ceded land, or so-called ceded land, and we hold religious attachment. We have gales in the water, we have but, you know, I mean, at the last meeting, I was sort of like, basically, the whole ocean is the Escanalo, beginning with the ocean itself. So this Navy project, this sonar project, goes all the way to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Papahanaumoku, This is huge. And out there, actually know some of the language, but what's important to know is that to that expansion, there are protections now, and we're trying to trigger them, right? Because even starting to the transportation begins with the coral, and then all life then comes to the newborn. But 
This is more than me. Huge ocean. Both sides. You know. How can we allow that to happen? Um, and I'll just tell you this story. How are we connected? We're connected in this way. In the Kumu people, there is a land animal, or there is a land entity, an ocean entity, that is the body. Now, we can see it right with the iliaki, the sandalwood, is the guardian of what? The whale. So, sandalwood trade comes to the way. And actually, there are old ancient bundles of sandalwood up walk along in the caves, still just left here. But the iliaki is taken, and then right after the whaling comes. It starts the Industrial Revolution. This is key because the Industrial Revolution, what's peeling the Industrial Revolution back is the same the well you know, peace movement, earth movement, green movement. All of those things are actually helping us reverse all of that impact that has occurred. But the Kukuna used to say there was so much whales could walk on Big Island to Maui on their back. But now, right? But Hawaii was a pu'uhonua for the whales. So, and in the chance of creation, they are born in the second law, the second epic period. So they actually help see us into being as the humans. Because most things were born before we were born. Humans. Then on the eighth day, man opened his eyes and light came into the world. So the, the Kanaloas, the whales, those entities come from the, the pole in the darkness and then they emerge and help us be born and hook up through into the time of the light that we know. So just like there's two places where the poles exist on Mauna Kea, in the highest, darkest night of the sky, and in the deepest, darkest ocean. That, those are the two places where creation continues to exist, according to Just because, you know, we don't chant it very much, doesn't mean it ends. It just means there's no one's continuing in that way. So I, I just want to say that I want to say one thing, and that is that as dire as things look, we are winning slowly, but consistently and sure. On the Mauna Kea thing, for example, we won every single case. The draconian rules were thrown out, the Kiai, none of their things stuck. Only two of them, and that's only because they didn't go back. But nevertheless, they were willing to take that function, even though they shouldn't have gotten it. Of course, throw it up, throw it up, throw it up. So there's that, <coughs> the Kwakaloa case. Those are the things we have to look at, because if we lose hope, we, then they win. They rely on that hopelessness, <laughs> because that's makes us not want to do anything. And so, um, I want to say in spite of them, but let's not say that word. Let's just say, we continue, oh, I know how to say it. We continue for, for goodness sake. Someone was telling me, um, yeah, Kiloa, you're speaking truth to power. And I was like, no. They were from Berkeley. And they, they're like, you know, from back in the day. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not speaking truth to power because they're not the power. <laughs> That's the truth. They're not the power. We're the power. Actually, the mountain is the power, the ocean is the power, the wind is the power, the volcano is the power, the tutukele is the power. I'm not going to give them that. The tuwa is the power. And
and we align with that and we move it forward. And after that, you know, they can talk to the hand, but in a loving, respectful way. We don't have to obey anything we don't agree with. So I'm just saying, keep up the resistance or the flow. We're flowing forward. <laughs> we give you guys back. We're all already dealing with this kind of world, doing all this stuff that isn't going We're done. And I think we need to stand up and say it. And we are. Shall we are? People all over the world. They're done. And it's okay to be done and move on. Because we're inviting them to live in a better way. And that's all I need. <laughs> Linda Faye's doing a Naleo TV, she's got a switcher tape. But our next speaker is going to be Dr. Lauren Pang, and uh, I think a lot of you know uh, Dr. Pang's background, he's uh, retired Army, was it 24 or 25 years, Lauren? 24. 24, the Army Medical Corps. And uh, he's been a great resource to us, uh, not only on the DU issue, but uh, on the anti-GMO issue. And his presentation tonight is uh, this unethical human experimentation. I'm really interested in this. Uh, this is, gives me the chills of, of uh, Nazi Germany in World War II. So, Lawrence, thank you for being here. And okay. Thank you. Um, usually I come to the Big Island to talk about depleted uranium. And, you know, one thing that really baffled me about the lawsuit is it said that, well, we didn't quite win because the military gets to keep bombing one spot. As far as I'm concerned, we know real well that chemicals and dust, especially dust, uh, it can spread 100 miles in three days depending on the wind. So when we deal with chemicals, you know, the half-life is what, two weeks, two months? How long does a chemical persist? Five half-lives? So it's 10 weeks, 10 months? So you got 10 weeks, 10 months, to blow around and it can go 100 miles in three days. You got dust, depleted uranium dust, radioactive dust. I don't really understand the lawsuit that, oh, well, we keep bombing this way. Fine. You keep your crap on your area, bomb all you want. But we know it drifts and this stuff is active millions of years. So I don't really quite understand that part of the lawsuit. But the other thing you also raised is that we talked about human experimentation. And it could be something as simple as breast cancer chemotherapy. I got a drug for breast cancer chemotherapy. Okay? Who wants to come in? You all decide. It's a private thing. I don't say, you know, okay, I've always decided. Everyone goes, you did? You didn't? It's confidential. And when she says no, the answer is really no. Nobody, no investigator, no doctor says, oh, gee, you're not being scientific. Um, she can say, my religion. She could say, who made this product, the military? The answer is no. The answer is simply no. It's her decision. It's unethical to badger her, point her out. So the reason I'm here to talk about human experimentation is because Jim Albertini, um, <clears throat> we, we had a mentor. Uh, her name was Rosalie Bertel. I never really met her face to face. She passed away. She was a nun. She was a physicist, trained physicist who was a nun, a German. And uh, she hunted out the depleted uranium, the radiation aspect. And uh, you know, I read all her papers and we wrote to each other and I was supposed to meet her but she passed away. In discovered in her papers, she says, gee, geoengineering of the earth, everything, bombing, chemicals, whatever, global warming, everything. People want to control the earth. And she says, I think that's got to be unethical. I can't quite connect the dots, but for human sake, I think that's unethical. So she refers to the origins of human experimentation, the Nuremberg trials. And I thought, whoa, it's right down our alley. <laughs> she passed away, we could have hit this off because I hunt out pesticides 
and she was looking at radiation. So I promised Jim I would look at the radiation issue and just play it out as we have looked at pesticides. And I'll do it for you tonight. Boy, was I shocked. There's 500 pages on the pesticide chemicals drifting all over, uncontrolled. There's 1.6 million pages on the radiation. Whoa, this is a major issue, and we'll go over some of that today. Now, this is the title of my talk. You put out some agent upon us, radiation, germs, chemicals, and at some point, it's you got to ask, is this unethical human experimentation? Is it unethical human experimentation? Now, a lot of my stuff hit the lawyers, and they said, no, it's not. You're, you're confusing the Nazi trials with spraying of the atmosphere. Well, I'm sorry, but there's this, you don't have to write this down. Jim has this, Papa has this. You go to this, this is the hearings in 1994 of the Cold War. Right after the Nuremberg trials, after we learned what's unethical, the U.S. military and university contractors went and did all kinds of horrible stuff to individuals and communities for the next eight years, and it was secret. It came out 30 years later, and in 1994, they had a hearing on this. What have we done? So we'll go over that, because what we had done and what we promised not to do again we're doing today. We seem to have forgotten. Next. Okay, let's get some definitions, a little bit, you know, homework there. What is a human experiment? Well, you test or you expose humans, not animals, not the environment. Rosalie Bertel said that you mess with the environment, eventually you mess with ourselves. All right, I just want to shortcut this and just mess with ourselves because we're part of the environment. And you expose them to something X. I don't care if it's radiation, biologic, chemical, and it's not fully understood. We're still a little uncertain about this. That's human experimentation. Now, wait a minute. Isn't this research? Research, human experimentation? No. Research is when you study something. Like, if I did a survey, what you guys eat for dinner? Who's the most nauseous guy? Oh, you, you, eat, you, eat, you didn't eat salad. That's a little research project, but I didn't experiment on you. I didn't give you weird food. A lot of times we experiment on things or people, and we do the research to find out what happened. So the volcano erupts. Well, we got SO2. I could do research. But did we experiment? Did we expose people to the fumes? Not really. Not unless you force people to go in, then that's experiment. All right, next. Next. Now. You see, you expose some people to something not fully understood, but it's this guy, the individual. So when the community says, well, it's okay with me, but well, one guy says it's not okay with me, he gets to opt out. That's the beauty of human experimentation, the rules. It's the individual. You can't all decide to go push her into those cultural zones without her Approval. Next, always remember that, the individual opinion. So Jim might say, hey, this is experimental. I might say, no, it's not. Well, then fine. You go breathe the air, and he doesn't. Can you separate out? Next. All right. I want to talk about uncertainty. I told you some of these agents are a little bit uncertain or not fully understood to different individuals. Hold up. Here's a scale. Very safe. Very dangerous. Now, we know some things kind of dangerous, maybe a vaccine. We know some chemicals kind of safe. So this is where you think it is. It's called the point estimate. Next. 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 OK. Around your point estimate, see this vaccine? Kind of dangerous. And here's your uncertainty. Is it really dangerous? Well, we're not real sure, but it's around here somewhere. Here's something kind of safe. But I really have no idea what it does. It's the uncertainty that makes it experimental. Okay? So sometimes if I just expose us to poison, guarantee poison, that's not an experiment. That's a crime. <laughs> but when I put you to a low level, and I don't know, that's uncertain. That's an experiment. And we have rules for experiments. 
Why do we have rules for ex human experimentation? Because we love human experimentation. That moves science forward, but it has to be done ethically, informed consent. Next, we'll get there. So this is the experimental one because it's so uncertain. Even though, yeah, you kind of hope you think it's safe. Next. All right. When you do human experiments, you can do it on individuals. This is the most unethical human experimentation of U.S. history. That's the Skeggy syphilis trials. Or you can do it on an entire group. Well, what do you mean? Don't, uh, isn't there a difference? The lawyers will tell you, wait, wait, there's a difference. No, there's not. The U.S. Congress ruled on this in 1994. The international agencies ruled on this. They said when you do it to an entire group, that's nothing more than a bunch of individuals. You better get everybody's informed consent. Furthermore, when you do it to the entire community, I just, re I, I just uh, recertified my human experimentation rules uh, two months ago. Sometimes the community has to give a consent, but never, it never, instead of the individuals. So first, maybe the Hawaiian said, well, we don't like this. But if the Hawaiian said, well, it's okay with us, you still need the individuals. It's never a substitute for individuals. Next. Okay, and then next. Now, it starts off with the Nuremberg trials. This is a little gory, but you have to deal with it because I had to deal with it. <laughs> Nazi Germany and the Axis power this is Dr. Ishii in Japan, Second World War. The doctors, this is the doctor's trials of Nuremberg. Turns out they did horrible things to people, individually. The Jews, the gypsies, the mentally retarded, the elderly. Essentially, there were 12 kinds of experiments, and typically this is the freezing experiment. You freeze the guy, and you see how cold you could make him to almost death, or death, because we didn't know when death was and when death. And you revive them. You said, let's bring them back. Why? Why did you do that? Because Nazi Germany was sending soldiers to Norway, and they got cold injury. And there's, when you revive somebody from cold, it's real spooky. There's a little zone. You get this arrhythmia, and they can die. So they studied 12 different ones, the radiation experiment, how close to death can you do it. On the other side of the Pacific, the Japanese were doing called vivisection, cutting open people live without anesthetics. Well, because if we put anesthetics, that might change the nature of the process I'm watching, like birth. So let's just cut them open and watch them give birth. Holy crap. Now, if you focus on the goriness, the racism, the ugliness, you will miss the point. The point of the Nuremberg trials is the Nuremberg Code it's coming up next, and they will tell you how to do medical experiments ethically. None of these people gave informed consent. Okay? So let's try not to focus on them. There were 21 Nazi doctors, seven were hung, seven life imprisonment, and seven kind of pardoned because I think they kind of spoke against it. But in the trial, this is the head, Dr. Brandt, before they hung him, he said, it was okay. We are not unethical. We did it for national interest, the war effort, and patriotism. And we also did it for science. Because you, Dr. Pang, will someday revive the jumper off the Golden Gate Bridge when he gets cold. And you learn, when you cross the cold barrier, what a rhythmia to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did use their stuff. Harvard said, use their stuff. Some countries said, don't use our stuff, it was unethical. But these arguments, national interest, war effort, it was ruled by the Nuremberg judges, that's no argument. National interest, war effort is not an argument for human experimentation. Okay? And neither is science. <laughs> but still we like to do it, we have to do it. Also, they warned in the trial that the state courts, national, state, county, of Germany or Japan, you think they're going to say, hey, I think that's unethical. No. So don't expect the countries that perpetuate these activities to say, yes, you're right, you're right. They will give you a biased interpretation, always, in the courts, whatever level, in the legislatures, whatever level. That's the ruling and finding of Nuremberg. Next. Oh, next. Oh, 
Okay, don't try to read this. There's actually a Nuremberg Code, 10 points. The main point is everybody in the study gives voluntary, well-informed, understanding, consent to be a subject. They can choose to be in or out. Also, if they already started, like now, you keep bombing Park the law, uh, you can leave at any time. Okay? And it's the individual guys who decide. And sometimes the community said, we decided for you. You cannot do this. But when the community says, one group says, you can do this, the individuals still get to say, well, not me. Next. I like these rules. I follow the rules. So when can you choose? I want to be an experiment. Here's the doctor enrolling the woman in cancer chemotherapy. Clinical trial. You know, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, okay. Water additive. Flint, Michigan. Holy cow. Flint got polluted. They changed the water. They said, I think it's drinkable. A bunch of people said, I don't think it's drinkable. You're experimenting on us. You don't like it? Get bottled water. The question was, who's going to pay? Him or the government? But you can avoid it. GM food. Uh, if it's labeled, I think you could avoid it. So you get to choose, kind of, well. Here's airborne stuff. This is our issue. Airborne bombing, DU. Look at that guy. He's tented his house for termites. The neighbor says, wow, I don't believe that stuff. But well, you don't like it? He tented it. Go to a motel three days, come back, and when it's over, you come back. If you don't like it, you can avoid it. Here's the military. We did little gas mass experiments. Uh, little exercise and they train you for a week and the culmination of the training is you go in the room, you spray with some kind of gas, you take off the mask, you say your name, rank, serial number, put the mask on and happily on your way. And they tell you, first it's going to be perfume. If you smell perfume, that bad, technically you're dead, you got to repeat the course. Then it was banana smell, okay. then pepper spray. But during the training of the military in the Cold War days, they actually switched to mustard gas. Guys died. They got mentally retarded. So that's the old switcheroo with no informed consent. That was bad. Poor information. Next. There's a couple times you cannot stay out of the trial. This woman says, I'm not in the cancer chemotherapy trial. I know. Uh, we tested a live Shigella vaccine in Bangladesh. A live vaccine. Spread to the community. 98% of the people said, we love it. Thank you, Dr. Pang, for helping us. 2% said, not me. You can't do it because it'll spread to those 2%. So I abide by the rules, but I see a lot of people not. Next, this is where you cannot control, you cannot opt out. When the stuff is drifting on the air, the dust of the depleted uranium, the pesticide, serratia, the chemical, when it's on the wind spreading hundreds of miles, I don't think that guy can opt out. Now maybe they can, maybe we'll all take a vote. Maybe if you sprayed it just once, those who didn't like it could go somewhere else. But you bomb every day, you spray your pesticides three times a week, forever. So everybody downwind, you can do it. You better get their informed consent. Good luck. Next. Okay, here's us, you know, spreading our pesticides. Uh, your bombing of Bahatalua actually spreads hundreds of miles too. Depleted uranium. Next. Okay, so this is Flint, Michigan. You don't like it? We'll get your own water. You can even get water from there if you want. Next. Next. Okay. That was the Nuremberg trials, setting the rules. Right after the Nuremberg trials, for 14 years, the U.S. and U university contractors did some horrible experiments that were secret for 30 years. What did they do? Well, they released radiation to individuals and communities. They released germs over the Bay Area and they released chemicals to individuals and communities. Lots of communities, lots of individuals. And it was all, oh, they did mind control, LSD. Uh, they tried to make people stutter. They did on the people who were neglected, because you never noticed if you did it on the mentally retarded. And they did it to entire communities. The Bay Area, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, this one, ah, I promise I'd focus on this. St. Louis, Minneapolis, and let's just talk about what they did for radiation. Next. Just the radiation, because I do pesticides. Okay. Never mind, it's here. He has a thing, but I'll just read the highlights. In the mid-50s, they released the fine powdery green dust 
over the people who were playing the kids in St. Louis streets. Well, the kid, it was sticky. It soon got brass thyroid skin, urine cancers, and the other sister died of rare forms of cancer. The woman in hindsight says, hey, we were the guinea pigs. You don't have to show harm. I mean, yeah, the, the sister died, but at the time you released it, you didn't know. You didn't get their informed consent. Sometimes you do experiments and it turns out, well, oh, that was great. You didn't know when you released it. You didn't get informed consent, that's unethical. Okay, so here they are spraying this, and then they released over the rooftops of St. Louis, over the poor black projects, <coughs> same chemicals. Now, this was obvious. What's that chemical you're doing? So the military told them, this is a cloaking device. We will hide your community so when the Soviets attack, they can't see you. No. <laughs> no, no, no. That, was a, that was a lie. But even if it was true, it doesn't matter. What is your cloaking device? I didn't give informed consent. And in fact, they released radium. Radium is a radioactive product of really, really releasing alpha emitters, just like DU. And it releases it for 1,600 years. And if you get it in your body, it will take 15 years to clear. Because I will contrast this to depleted uranium next. And so when they did that over the uh, 11th floor of the woman, poor woman, uh, her father died quickly and all her kids got messed up. Mm -hmm. Then she says, you know all this stuff that happened, this is in hindsight 30 years later, was run by a team of scientists who don't seem to communicate with anyone, who have no moral compass, and here's us, here's them, and they cloak it under confidentiality. Confidentiality, if it's national interest, is not an argument according to the Nuremberg rules. Next. Okay. I keep quoting the Nuremberg rules, and my own lawyers say, yeah, yeah, that's international stuff. We're in the U.S. You want something U.S.? Here's the findings of the 1994 U.S. Congress. All right. Based on the Nuremberg rules, all right, all of that stuff you guys did in the Cold War with violations on the communities and the individuals. Communities are nothing more than a bunch of individuals. You're going to do it to the community, you get everyone's informed consent with downwind. All right, same guidelines. Then, no harm has been shown. What does that mean? That means I'm going to keep doing it until I see harm. Yeah. By definition of an experiment, you don't know harm. So it's not that you, you do it, if, if you know harm, it's a crime. If you don't know harm, it's an experiment. So no harm has been shown doesn't mean anything under the framework of experimentation. Then science and national security are never justifications against the individual's rights. Don't expect the individuals to get any kind of support from your system that operates from the U.S. system. Not in the courts, not in legislation, not in the regulatory agencies. Don't expect anything. But the regulatory agencies spoke up during the hearing and said, we will, we, will, we will honor this. And so 16 regulatory agencies, and I think the Atomic Energy, said we will never do human experimentation again without informed consent. That's good, <laughs> except there's one little clause in there. When you get informed consent, it's freely given. There's no enticement or coercion. And I'm talking about financial. And when we fought pesticides on Maui, who was there telling us the economic input into the Maui community by the GM companies. Who is there telling us the military input and a RIMPAC economic value? That's called economic enticement and coercion. You are not to do that in case you forgot. Mm -hmm. But they seem to forget a lot nowadays. See, no coercion, job loss. Mm -hmm. ultimate, the ultimate intention doesn't really matter on the human exposure. In other words, I'm trying to kill a plant pest. Now, I know you guys got exposed, but I'm trying to kill a plant pest. I'm not trying to hurt you. That's human experimentation. In fact, some of this stuff they released was to increase communication in the ionosphere. I don't care what the intent is, cloaking device or whatever. Humans were exposed. The end. Next. Pretty straightforward. I want to do this for you. This is my own. I want to put in perspective Experimentation without informed consent. That's a no-no. Today, you hear all about the stuff, immigration rights and rules, gun control, the Me Too movement, voter registration, sanctuary city, blah, 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 blah. 
all the rights. My own folks said, hey, Kang, you're so much into rights, next thing you'll be supporting gun rights. Wait, let's put this in a little perspective. These are refugees on the Burmese-Thai border. I did my human experiments in them curing malaria. I got their informed consent. The refugees do not have many rights. They can't drive, they can't vote. They're in a foreign country, they can get a car. But they do not give up the right to be experimented on without informed consent. Some of them said no. And so those five said no. And they got malaria, and the next year they said yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's funny, but prisoners, Joliet Prison, malaria trials, you cannot do it on them. They lose many rights, prisoners, but you cannot experiment on them without informed consent. You really can't do it on them anymore because that's subtle coercion. You know, when he volunteered, then he got extra rations or something. Here is a Chinese general executed by a Japanese general, and they told the Chinese general, it's not racism, you're an honorable man, you're going to die. Would you like to contribute to medical science? It's illegal. You, he loses many rights, but you cannot even approach him because he, he, it is a form of coercion because I'll feed your family extra if we kill you. And finally, this is the Dr. Schilling, the Nazi doctor who's hung. And he says, I still say national interest vindicates me. I still say science. And I want to give my body, and they cut him off, put the bag over him, hung him. We do not even do to him what he has done to others. This is a high order right. I've written to our Attorney General, you argue for immigration, you argue for Me Too movement, all this stuff. What about this? Experimentation without informed consent. Next. Okay, DU, quickly. Depleted uranium, here it is. It's emitting alpha particles. It's the leftover from the nuclear reactor. It emits alpha particles, which is really blocked. The other particles penetrate. Next. Now, if you external, you won't get it. Your skin will block it. But when you breathe it, whoa, that stuff is coming in. Alpha particles, the most dangerous particle, when internalized. Next. But oh, this is good. Jim's copy got messed up. Yours is good. All right. So what did we do? We released all these spotter rounds and unknown stuff on Pohaka Law, millions of tons. Every time you blow it up or bomb it again, 50% goes up as dust. Some dust stays suspended forever. Some jumps 20 miles at a time, and some creeps along the ground till you bomb it again. Okay, and here it is for us to breathe. Next. All right, this is the Wikipedia of depleted uranium. Today, we still do not know its toxicity. Some people might say, that's too experimental for me. What? What? Did the, the Cold War experiments do depleted uranium? No, they did radium. Depleted uranium was discovered in 1970 when the Russians armed their tank. Quickly, in 1980, the US said, we will penetrate their depleted uranium shield with depleted uranium penetrators. And so 1991, we released it in the Gulf War, in Bosnia, the bombings, and in Syria. Next, how much did we release? Well, 315 to 350 tons in the 1991 Gulf War. 10 to 15 tons in Yugoslavia. In the first three days of, of Iraq, first three days, 1,000 tons. Oh, that's a lot of depleted uranium. Next. So that's the exposure worldwide. And what are we doing at PTA? I have no idea. But whatever you did, it's now is depleted uranium oxides. The oxides persist in your body for months, sorry, for decades, maybe several decades. Radium, the one we did to the poor black communities, 15 years. This stuff can go in your body and not clear it for <clears throat> several decades. Do not be confused. The military will tell you depleted uranium clears the body in weeks. That's depleted uranium. Depleted uranium oxides stay in your body, radiating away. Next. <coughs> All right. Here's the international response. I didn't know this. 1996, 97, they considered it international group weapon of mass destruction. Oh. Finally, they urge all states, urge, urge, not ban, urge, to curb the use. Okay. And they said this is a human rights violation and you're violating humanitarian norms. 
I urge you to stop doing that. Okay, you urge me. Yeah. Then in 2002, they delivered a paper and said, those who continue, we will challenge you on Declaration of Human Rights, United Nations, Genocide Convention, whoa, Convention Against Torture, Geneva Convention, blah, blah, blah. You're violating all these conventions, so we urge you to stop. Next. Now, here is one. I would like to add violation of human experimentation. That's a biggie. We know how to do that. We hung guys for that. We didn't urge them to stop. Next. The European Parliament, oh, here we go. They are consistently requesting a moratorium, but France and the UK have said it is, the health risk has not been substantiated. You haven't proven harm. So what? It's experimental. To prove harm is a crime. Actually, it's a crime. It's a weapon of mass destruction. But in the dilutions over PTA, that's an experimental. We follow experimentation protocol. Next. And the Nazis, you could have said the same argument during the Nazi trials. But you, you haven't actually proven how dangerous this is. So I don't care how you urge and request. We just got to ignore them. No teeth so far. Next. Okay, now we're getting close. 2012, 155 states support the resolution. Because of the uncertainty, hey, I didn't put the word in. Uncertainty, is that part of experimentation? Uncertainty, they want to go with the precautionary principle. You don't have to prove harm. You assume it's dangerous because it's uncertain. All right, 2014, here they are. The General Assembly, they want you to, you know, stop that. <coughs> But they also want the affected states, I think that's us, Bohakaloa, to help uh, other states using it identify and manage the states that you trash. In other words, all you guys who bombed Iraq, Yugoslavia, Syria, the guys who bombed, there's a resolution to go help them identify, manage, and clean up. Maybe they'll come here next. Uh, this is the final slide. I want to move this issue to human experimentation framework. It has teeth, more than just urging and requesting. It is based on the individual. Hey, two guys say no, it's on the win, they have to no. It's a high priority human right. Yep. It supersedes national interests, and there's questionable national regulatory decisions. No harm has been shown. Becomes a very strange argument when you talk about experimentation. That's why you do it experiment because you really don't know the harm. It's an individual decision, confidential, and you cannot be ridiculed for it. Now, mom's against Monsanto. Well, you guys aren't scientists. Hey, she gets to decide. You don't get to say you're dumb. Okay? You don't get to say you're not a scientist. You don't even get to know how she decided. It's confidential, her decision. Okay, all of this has precedent. Nuremberg trial, Cold War hearings, U.S. There's written rules. It applies to community as well as individuals. Yup. Some settings, ooh, live virus and on the air. The, you can't sort out who's who. Two people say no, it's no. Now Maui voted a majority. But if two guys said no, well, I mean, the answer is still no. I'm not against any product. Like, I want to make this clear. Medical research is good, but you have to do it ethically. For example, organ transplant. That's brilliant. I took his liver and he gave it to me. But if done in the wrong way, if it's trafficking, that's terrible. The transplant was trafficking. You paid him without his information, I gave him. But if it's done right, and he gives informed consent, and we search the internet for all the compatible people, that's brilliant. It's not the product, it's how you wield it on people without their informed consent. I think that's the last one. Thank you. Uh, Jim and you have been smart. Yeah. Just one point of clarification. Uh, Lauren talked about DU uh, and versus DU oxide. Yes. Uh, DU was used at Wapaloa as a spotting round, it was a metal. But that metal has been hit by 70 years of high explosives and it's burned. And therefore, the metal is transformed into DU oxide. Correct. And that's the hazard when DU oxide dust particles. It's not the metal in an external exposure, it's the internalized DU oxide. But thanks. Take a break. Take a break for five minutes, and then we'll turn it over to Pocket.
Thank you. Some snacks in the back. Help yourself. Glasses here, though. Wait, wait, wait. You don't come too fast. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, our next speaker, Isaac Kaka Hart, uh, Hawaiian National. And he's going to give us a uh, Hawaiian perspective on uh, occupation and impact and all of the problems facing the kingdom. I've known Kaka a long time. He and I, and Corey, and a few others, intervened in the, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on the use of depleted uranium in the Pahapalo. So, Haka is a tremendous researcher. I have a lot of respect for him. He really digs in documents the facts and all. So, I know his presentation tonight is going to have a lot of hard data for us. So, Haka, thanks for coming all the way over from Pony. Got off to work and drove over. So, I had to make some tea for you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Mahalo, everybody, for coming out after this seem to be working very well for us. So I'm looking for better solutions so we can actually get to get something done. But you know, I mentioned uh, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Papahana, uh, Mokwakea, Nefermin Monument, uh, the expansion. And uh, I actually drafted the plan that led to the designation of the Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve in 2000, which was the largest marine protected area in the world at that time. And then George W. Bush decided to uh, lay a monument designation over the reserve. Uh, basically, in my, my personal opinion, to promote uh, his uh, eco-friendliness, uh, which is absolutely false, but he went ahead and he just threw that monument designation over the reserve. And the reserve protected the water basically from three miles offshore to 50 miles and the state of Hawaii controls three miles to the shoreline. And the expanded area expanded the monument protection from 50 miles up to 200 miles, the exclusive economic zone. And uh, the fisheries, uh, federal fishery management, uh, long line fishery has been ex now excluded from the area, which is, uh, I think a lot of the local fishermen are grateful for. If there's thousands of miles of line they can lay every day in the water, millions of folks. So at least it leaves a little corridor where more fish can get to the island where the local community can benefit from the uh, fishes that get here. And if you go and look at the executive order that uh, expanded the monument, there's the armed forces section. Uh, you look at that on the numbers two and three. It, uh, uh, State something like if the military causes any harm out there, they need to mitigate or repair the damages. There was not, it never anything like that before. They had totally free reign out there. They used to bomb the islands. Kobani uh, Agar, uh, old time fisherman, he used to have an exclusive lease for Turn Island fishing out there. He had an agreement with the military, maintained the runway, and he had exclusive access to the fisheries. And he thought he was in, in Nirvana, he called it. He thought he was going to become a millionaire. And they were very surprised uh, within a year's time, they destroyed the fisheries around the entire island. And, mm -hmm. and, and the several years that he remained in the fisheries, never did return. And that's because those islands out there are very low, with low nutrient flow into the ocean, so it doesn't supply a large uh, ecosystem like we do here in the main islands. But, 
suspension did do some stuff and unfortunately we're in a situation, the reason I wrote that plan was because I was involved with uh, Westpac, uh, the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. I was the president, uh, the, the chairman of the First Native and Indigenous Rights Advisory Panel to them. And I became a member of all six advisory panels, trying to figure out how they manipulate the process and how it all works. And the Hawaii Monsio was starving because of the lobster fishery. They were destroying the lobster stocks. When they first started, they would catch an average of five lobsters per trap. And towards the end, it took five traps to catch one lobster. And they drove the population down so low that uh, the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council is uh, basically run by the large scale fishing industry. So they, they sit in the top position in, in the Fishery Management Council. So they adopted uh, new regulations, which are called a Retain All Fishery Management Plan. They reduced the lobster uh, trap mesh, it was two inches by two inches, approximately that, that large. They reduced it down to one inch, one inch by two inches, uh, skiing like that, and they allowed themselves to keep every lobster that entered the trap. Uh, nowhere else I, I have I ever heard in the world where they allow the retention of very female. Nowhere else but in Hawaii. They're taking lobsters with tails as small as your thumb, mm. selling those as decorations on these high-end seafood platters in these high-end restaurants and things. So I kept trying to stop them from fishing around the monk seals, causing the starvation. And a lot of people are unaware that we have a lot of monk seals in the main islands now because the National Marine Fishery Service was relocating the monk seals to the main islands. Because the seals were starving, the males were getting very aggressive, attacking the females and the babies and killing them. So they decided to start relocating. And that's why we have a lot of monk seals in the main islands now. A lot of people were never made aware of that. And I tried to get the Marine Mammal Commission involved. They wrote letter after letter after letter to Western Pacific Fish Management Council trying to get them to stop the lobster fishing around the, the Muxil population and they continually disregarded those. And unfortunately, the Marine Mammal Commission is only an advisory council council. They cannot order anybody to stop doing anything. So the National Fishery Service basically is the rule making, uh, policy making, uh, agency of the federal government and with the Pacific Fisherman Management Council was run uh, by the executive director, her name is Kitty Simons, for the past several decades. And although she is merely an executive director of a fishery advisory council, her uh, income is higher than her boss, the Secretary of Commerce. Mm. She's paid higher than the Secretary of Commerce. So how does the executive director of a fishery advisory council make more money than the Secretary of Commerce? But in her younger years, she was uh, an aide to Senator Daniel Inouye, and he pretty much supported her along the way. But she could get away with murder, and it would be her insulation. So the only way I could see of getting control of that area away from there was to write a plan and uh, the only way for that plan to actually move forward is we need a large number of people. So Hawaiian organizations, environmental organizations from Hawaii got together. We uh, put up that draft plan. It was a PowerPoint. We went line by line and we had Puna Fisher people, environmentalists, culture related tourism people. I wanted to try and get a plan together that everybody could agree on. And then we pushed that forward as a community plan. And then we solicited support from uh, large NGOs up in the United States. And to the point we got over 5 million supporters for that before introducing it to Washington, D.C. And we made a few trips up there and uh, I was not very surprised that some of the federal agencies were also looking for some kind of solution to stop Westpac from uh, being the out of control child that it was. So a lot of fellow guys was kind of glad that the community came up with this plan. And I feel kind of bad. I know we're uh, living under an unlawful occupation, but sometimes we'll force my own situation to use their unlawful laws to protect what we have left. And that's exactly what I did. And uh, you know, about the same time, I think in 1999, the Department of Energy and four partner countries wanted to conduct uh, carbon dioxide 
dumping experiment in Hawaii of Kiaholi Point in Kona. Uh, so what they plan to do is run this pipe, pump the Kofi CO2 into the ocean to see what would happen with that new food. And this was all to support uh, the carbon credit trading industry. We need to capture the exhaust from industrial smokestacks, and if we compress it, it liquefies it. And they wanted to find a place to hide that, so they could uh, address the global uh, warming concern. And they wanted to charge the industry for this. So they tried to find the cheapest way to hide this uh, liquefied uh, CO2 and they were dumping it in the ocean. And I did some research on that and found that you can put it in the ocean, but it's like what creates the bubbles in our soda. That stuff will eventually bubble back up and escape back into the atmosphere sometime in the future. And the scientists who uh, created this whole thing, they admitted that that was in fact true. It would escape sometime in the future, but we need to address the problem now. So I accused them of creating a time bomb for the future. They didn't appreciate that very much. But I got the EPA involved and uh, brought in the international laws of the sea which prohibit the dumping of industrial waste, which is exactly what that would have been. And the Department of Energy, on their own website, they had a computer projected model. If they installed a large facility to dump CO2 into the ocean up near Maine, over a 20 year period, the entire eastern coast and halfway down South America, the marine life would be dead. Because that stuff dissolves calcium carbonate, which is why the shells of the shellfishes, the corals, and everything are made of. But they, they know. They, the computer models already told them this is going to happen if you do it, and they were going to go ahead with that energy. But we continued working against that, and we, uh, everybody thought it was crazy, and we'd never, never be able to be a federal uh, uh, agency. So we weren't about to give up, so we actually prevailed right now. So then we drew the proposal for Kona. Then a friend of mine, Dr. Dave, David Holzman, he went to Kauai for vacation, and he saw a little ad in the newspaper. We were proposing to do it on Kauai. In a, a former ocean dump site, which was basically the same thing. So, Dr. Uh, uh, him and I went into Hawaii and not to fight for the people there, but to show the people how to fight for themselves. Because uh, if we fight for them, we're going to be become dependent on people fighting for them. And we don't need that. We need people to know how to fight for themselves. And so, we went over there and we caught them, we brought the EPA in and everything and the project was shut down in Hawaii. Wow. And one of the partner countries was Norway. So they went to Norway, the Norwegian, by the time I found out, the Norwegian government has already approved the experiment to occur there. And Greenpeace International called me up, which I was very thankful for because I don't know how to speak Norwegian, I don't have money to get to Norway and fight that thing. And so they called me up and asked, oh, what, how do we view them in Hawaii? So I thought of all the information I had and I told them, you know, the Norwegian government has already approved these experiments to occur in a fjord over there. So my advice to you is get permission from the government to take your ship into the harbor, invite the government officials aboard your ship and give them a presentation, particularly the international law of the sea violation. So they did that and the government at that point rescinded approval, so mm -hmm. it stopped in this track right there. And during that the, the year that we went through that, we were trying to encourage them to, uh, they, they call it carbon dioxide sequestration. Sequestration is locking away forever. And putting it in the ocean is definitely not locking it away forever. So we encourage them to pump it back into the oil fields where they pump out the oil that create this, this carbon dioxide. And so they, they decided to use that to try it. They found it actually useful. They can do a strategic drilling, pump that stuff in, and they can push the oil that's trapped in the rocks into collection points so they can get more oil out of it. So, so and then that actually locks it up. So there's some other things I've been involved with and I need to apologize to my kids because I haven't been that great of a parent because of my involvement in all this, this kind of stuff. But what I'm trying to do is make a better world for them and, and our future generations. But anyway, so I'm, I'm gonna move on to my presentation, I don't want to talk about RIMPAC, so this is the 26th RIMPAC. 
There's not something new. It happens every uh, year here in Hawaii. And what it is is basically uh, new products and trade show for military technology. <laughs> so they invite all these different countries to Hawaii to show off their new technology stuff and try and start selling weapons. So the United States is the largest uh, weapons exporter in the world. Uh, so there's a lot of corporations that make billions of dollars off of selling uh, weapons of mass destruction. And that's something we need to completely turn around. And some of the smaller economy countries that are coming here, I, I think the United States invite them to kind of intimidate them. Don't mess with us. Look at what we got. So you'll be facing this kind of action if you mess with us. You better be, remain our ally or else. And I think it's a very dumb move on the United States behalf by disinviting China to participate in these games because China, I think, will become the next global power. So they have the largest population in the world, perhaps the largest land base, and their economy is a lot stronger than the United States. They can afford more. The United States can't afford it anymore. And I just feel bad for the young men and women that serve in these uh, United States military forces, a lot of them believe that they're doing the right thing for freedom and all that, but all they're doing is promoting corporate military good sales. That's all they're doing. And the you know, United States has time and time again inflicted self pain, self inflicted pain. You know, like, uh, in Cuba, they left their, their uh, one of the ships in, in Havana Harbor. They claimed that, I guess, some Spanish uh, interest had torpedoed the ship and sank it, and that's how they got into the Spanish American War. But years later, some divers went down and they discovered that the hull was blown up from the inside. It wasn't anything that came from the outside. So it was self inflicted. And, you know, I think this kind of thing happens very often. I think, uh, World Trade Center is one of the more high profile cases where that happened. And they wiped all the evidence out as quickly as they could. The gold that was in the basement disappeared. So there's big questions on all this gold in the United States supposedly taking care of all these countries. I believe it might have been China that asked for a return of the gold. So a lot of countries were afraid of different countries stealing the gold for the United States. Oh, we strong, we will protect your gold for a lot of you guys, you want to buy your gold. But they put all the gold in the United States and some of the countries are asking for the gold back now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was China that stepped forward and the United States, after a few years, offered to give them back 10% of their gold. And they said, in a few years, we can give you back another 10%. So they don't have the gold. Where did all the gold go? But there's a big question about uh, all the wealth that the United States has stored in safe storage supporting for the country. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm really, I don't know what you call it, that the injuries run deep, the occupation, what they've done to multiple generations of uh, Hawaiians, regardless of race. Well, a, lot, a lot of people mistake the word Hawaiian as, as a race. Hawaiian is a nationality just as American is. So we had uh, Hawaiians that were Japanese, Filipino, Portuguese. It's about every race that inhabits Hawaii today. We had Hawaiians uh, of just about every race. So Hawaiian is, keep in mind, it's a nationality. The race of the Aboriginal people of Hawaii is Kanaka Maoli not Hawaiian. Hawaiian is uh, our nationality. Uh, anyway, let me start with this presentation. Uh, problems need solutions. I guess we all can agree with that. So, the 26th Rim Pact, which has run from 1971 to the present, is just one of the many ongoing problems that we face. Uh, basically, we face problems basically on a, a daily basis. We, we never without problems. I can't think think of a time in my life where, where there was not a problem going on. So finding solutions, in my personal opinion, there's two keys to successful solutions, and they are unity and organization. 
And uh, you know, people say there's power in numbers, but it can only be power in those numbers if it's organized. <coughs> you can have a thousand people doing a thousand different things, and it's not going to have much effect. If a thousand people are pushing that same rock up the hill, you might move it. But if a thousand people are doing something else, it's not going to do anything. So you need to be organized, and you need to be unified. And then I ask here, are existing models available to consider? So I look from the viewpoint of my small world. Anybody know any models that out there that we might consider? So please share them if anybody has any. If not, I'll move forward. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah I'd like to mention, I think uh, Nicaragua is at the point of being a world leader again because they're refusing to uh, react with guns. And uh, they actually captured 15 police and took away their guns. I assume when they, they painted them with the slogan gun and actually returned their rifles, I assume, without ammunition because they're refusing to react. They said, uh, my wife has now escaped from Nicaragua as well, just a few hours ago. And as well as their son who's in Spain, uh, because he's, you're not allowed to land in this country to transfer to another country. But, uh, they, 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 so yeah, the argument is, is, hey, look where the other revolution got us. You know, now, now the guy with the liberator, he's the dictator. Yep. So, so that's quite something, because of course, other country in the world was helping Nicaragua and the previous revolution. Wonderful to hear. Is a peaceful solution to every problem. And we don't need to kill all our brothers and sisters to prove a point. And I think most people are being killed because somebody is greedy and wants to do natural resources. So I think that's one of the main things that's happening in the world now. So my answer is yes, a uh, few examples. Kamehameha is the first organized physical forces to unify the Hawaiian Islands, so we know that's true. Kamehameha the third organized a constitutional government to unify the Hawaiian Kingdom with other sovereign nations of the world. You know, we know that's true and we have uh, treaties to prove it. We have treaties with several nations. And when the United States invaded uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893, the Hawaiian Patriotic League was formed and they organized member branches from the various islands and they unified 21,269 people uh, under my time there, uh, signatures on the Kuei Anti Annihilation Petition. And 21,269 signatures might not seem that great to us today, but if you imagine back then, the population was roughly 40,000, so that was over half the population. Mm -hmm. So if we could do something like this today with computers and everything, we would call that a big feat, 21,000. But uh, they did it back then on foot, horseback, going island to island on canoes and ships, and they did this manually. And something like this would be difficult for us today, even with our computers and Facebook and all that stuff. But there are examples of uh, things that have been organized and unified to accomplish uh, bring a solution to some problem. Sorry. Oh, my time I want to just give you a brief history of the Hawaiian Patriot League. And it began uh, with adopting of its founding constitution on March 4, 1993, under the leadership of its president, Joseph Nawahi. Joseph Nawahi was actually from Hilo. So the Hawaii Patriot League originated in Hilo. They held their meetings in the old Salvation <coughs> Army building here in Hilo. And that's where the whole movement started for the Hawaii Patriotic League. So Joseph Nawahi was eventually put in jail where he contracted uh, tuberculosis and died. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next president that was elected was James Collier. So they had an amendment to their constitution under his leadership in 1897. 
And I went to Great League voluntarily in 2001. And then I put a note here that when the organization dissolved, its governing documents, uh, constitutions, bylaws, etc., are, are no longer binding on anyone, including the uh, members that were uh, part of that league. So the White Picard League was reconstituted in 1997 under the leadership of Keanu Sai, Kelly, Gucci, and Umi Sai. The Reconstituted League adopted that constitution on April 3rd, 1991, uh, 1999. The Reconstituted League assumed the position of acting constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom with its members assigned to executive and judicial branches. I don't know if anybody sees any problem with a group of people assuming the position of the constitutional government and appointing their members to certain offices, but uh, I personally I agree. But, uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom has laws, and we have a constitution, and in order to represent, represent yourself as the government, you need to follow those laws and constitutional provisions. You can't just self-appoint yourself to a position like that. So they, they claim to have done so under the doctrine of necessity and I've recently been told that uh, the people cannot hold elections unless the government uh, gives them the say so. So they essentially they tell the government that so we can't hold elections to elect our district representatives to move the process forward to reestablish our government unless they say so. But I say if they did this under the doctrine of necessity, the people can do the same thing. Uh, why wants to prohibit us? Uh, if we do that, are you going to enforce some kind of law against us? But uh, they have a website that's still up, and, and in the words of its last president, Mount <coughs> Napoleon and Vice President Curtis Featherin, as a result of low membership, we have sat patiently in the wing since 2005. So I wonder why was their membership so low? Yeah, a lot of people don't appreciate people being self-appointing themselves as the government. And I think that's one of the problems with a lot of our independent sovereignty groups is everybody wants to be the king, they self-appointing themselves, their members and stuff as the government. And we probably have about a couple of dozen governments right now and none of them is recognized as the government. So there is a process to restore the government and we just haven't reached that point yet. There's a lot more work to do towards uh, unifying and organizing the people, and not just Kanaka Mohori. So the only people that are, would be allowed to vote in the restoration of the government are descendants of Hawaiian nationals, regardless of race. And you must meet residency requirements as well. So Hawaiians that live abroad will not be able to vote unless they meet the minimum residency requirement of one year. So uh, on June 18, 2016, a video conference meeting was held by a voluntary assembly of Hawaiian patriots to discuss restoring the league and drafting bylaws to guide its restoration. So we didn't want to just uh, go out and create some organization. We wanted to have bylaws and things. And believe it or not, back in 1893, the folks that uh, created the Hawaiian Patriotic League initially they operated under parliamentary procedures. And for them, it was basically second nature because most of them were attorneys, government officials, so they kind of lived in that parliamentarian life. Uh, they, they knew the functions of parliamentarian procedure and everything. So it was very easy for them. And let me continue. On August 13, bylaws were adopted and officers were elected to serve on an interim council tasked with restoring, and this is the official name from back in 1893. Ka'aha Hui Hawaii Aloha Aina o Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. So if you look at a lot of the uh, Hawaiian Kingdom documents, legal documents and things, you will find that reference Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. That is the actual name of Hawaii, Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. And in English, it translated to the Hawaiian Patriotic League of the Hawaiian Islands. So we use the abbreviated form Kaha'a is 
On January 14, the Interim Council, uh, 2017, the Interim Council adopted a code of ethics for Hawaiian state jobs. So we felt that behavior in group setting was an important thing. So, you know, there's been meetings and things where uh, people have stood up and start shouting and interrupting other people and stuff like that. And we don't need to be behaving that way. You know, we need to respect other people. So they might not think the same as us, but they have the right to think the way they want to think. And if it's their time to speak, have the courtesy to hear them out, and they should uh, precipitate and hear you out when you're trying to speak. So on March 4, 2017, the Hawaiian Patriarch was officially restored. And from August 4th through 6th, 2017, the first annual convention of the league in more than a century was held at the Kanaina building on the grounds of the Alani Palace. That was a very historical moment, and uh, we visited the, the clean bedroom uh, in a, a private uh, visitation at night. We, we, we did a special session for us at night. So we went there and for the very spiritual, very touching moment, a lot of tears. And so I went into the palace, we could enter our bedroom, you know, in elementary school and had a bed and everything in there, we could uh, look over it. But uh, I guess because of the, they want to preserve the food as best they could, they put it in a plexiglass case and so nobody can touch it or anything, so it's protected for, uh, to extend the life of it. A very touching moment. And I believe it was held in, in an appropriate place, uh, our first convention. So we had uh, 22 de delegates that attended, and the delegates are elected by the branches. So we had uh, six chartered branches at that point in time, who were brand new, and we actually are still brand new, but not uh, just a little over a year right now. And uh, the delegates are elected uh, based on the number of members you have. For every 10 members in your branch, you get to elect one delegate. And your Pelican Canada or President is an automatic delegate. So six of the uh, delegates were the presidents of the six branches and the rest were elected by the members participating. And as I mentioned earlier, the parliamentarian procedure, uh, the convention business took place under the supervision of a credential par parliamentarian. And we're very fortunate to have uh, a registered parliamentarian, Kiyokani Martial from Las Vegas, uh, serve as our recording secretary. And he's actually the one who did a few years of research into the Hawaiian Patriotic League before we actually got moving into the process of restoration. So we, we tried to mirror the original league uh, as best we could, and just some minor uh, differences to fit uh, in the modern day time. The night, nine of the convention delegates were elected to serve as the officers of the league central body as prescribed under the bylaws. So the central body is uh, the primary uh, officer that kind of control what's going on, carries out the work, and things like that. And our officers uh, come from all of the different branches. Some of the branches have multiple officers, like the branch I serve is the Waimea branch. I'm the president of the Waimea branch. And uh, Kainoa Stafford uh, is uh, the treasurer for the Hawaii Patriotic League, and he's our vice president. And this is now your wife, T.E. over here, video TV, Mahalo TV. And uh, so some other branches have this one officer. The president of the Hawaiian Patriot League is Leilani Lindsay Taapuni. She's mm -hmm. also the president of the Hilo branch. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, we elected uh, Wahimi as the Pelican Canada, which is very fitting because our last queen was the Pelican Canada. And I think, uh, from my personal perspective anyway, women are better leaders. I think the uh, men, 
have a problem with our egos. So I, think, I think if the world was made by women, I don't think we would have as much problems as we do now. Women are experiencing childbirth. We, we men have no idea what that entails. We think we're a big part of it, but actually we're not. So, I would support a world run by women. All countries run by women. I was the chairman of the resolutions committee and uh, 32 re draft resolutions were submitted, 31 were adopted during convention. But having sat uh, through the, the past year on convention, thinking about the resolutions, we created a lot of work for ourselves. And we could have done that without resolution, so uh, that was kind of a waste of energy. But we did create a lot of resolutions calling on the uh, halt to bombing the co-op law and a lot of things. So that's something that we, we at least can get on record that we continue to resist the occupation. But a lot of things uh, I think we need to rethink uh, in the process of this. So this resolutions idea came from, I think basically Kale Mailia Ali, which is one of our branches. They were a Hawaiian Civic Club uh, branch and they resigned from the Civic Club because the Civic Club are going in the wrong direction for supporting federal recognition and even, uh, I believe, the Pledge of Allegiance and singing the American oh. song and the convention. And the Hawaiian Civic Club, which is really bizarre. <coughs> so, the new leadership that, that took over, uh, they full on for Americanization. They, they want, a lot of them are just so ma'a or accustomed to living off federal grants that they want to stay in that loop. It, it's like their meal ticket. So, they don't care the negative effect on the rest of the people, as long as they get the federal grant, they're happy. So a lot of this is based on money. So money is, like a lot of people say, the root of all the evil. So, you know, we had a object, the object in our bylaws, which is like the purpose. Uh, it was amended uh, during the convention, and I wasn't very happy with this, but uh, the majority rules. A lot of this influence came from uh, some of the folks that uh, support Keanu Thai, which I'm, I'm not against them supporting anybody, but uh, a lot of people I guess, don't trust him or don't, don't uh, subscribe to a lot of things he does. But you know, everybody has to do their thing, and he's he doing some good work out there, along with Leon Seal and a lot of other people. But I have nothing against what they're doing, but. Uh, when they try to insert a lot of his language into things, I, I'm not too happy about it. But you can read the object for yourself here. Object of the shall be to affirm the continuity of Hawaiian independence. That was basically what our original one was, as well as to restore Hawaiian national identity. Uh, to exert all peaceful and legal efforts to secure for the Hawaiian people and citizens the civil rights and to ensure that the United States of America complies with international humanitarian law. So, I ask myself, how can we, as a small group of people, ensure the United States of America is going to comply with international humanitarian law? We're basically powerless to do that because we're such a small number of people. If we were a few hundred thousand, we might be able to affect some change in that direction, but that won't happen, not, not, not under our current conditions. And I need to make something here. Uh, Kaha'a, uh, the new Hawaiian Patriotic League, has no desire to serve in the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, acting or otherwise. I think that's one of the main things that uh, has kept us divided on all of these decades. All these different groups, they all want to be the boss. They want to be the government. They want everybody to follow them. There was a few occasions where we tried to get the group to unify, but you know, one group or another wants to be the top dog, and they want everybody to subscribe to whatever their notions are. And those efforts to unify them have continually failed. 
So we need to have a unification under our body where everybody is equal. Everybody has their voice heard the same way. So I encourage the different groups to create their own branches. So there's several uh, independent groups. So they can create their own branches so they can put their manau into the process directly. And what we're hoping for is to get to a point like we had in the old days. Uh, but anyway, uh, the league is was restored to unify and organize Hawaiian patrons and supporters to further pursuit of justice of the Hawaiian Kingdom under the model, same model used in 19, 1893. So we've identified 59 branches from the original league. 59 branches of way back in 1893. Between 1893 and 1901. Some branches were added as the years went by, but they built themselves up to 59 branches. Currently, we only have seven branches. So the first six branches out of the Puna were established and um, participating in the, the first annual convention. Puna is a brand new branch, and I believe it's the uh, Great granddaughter of Navahi, I believe, is the president, served as the president of the Puna branch. So it's a gift from heaven to say, have the same blood line involved in the Hawaiian Patriot League. So we have the Honolulu branch, uh, Kale Mariali. Uh, uh, let me step back for one second. Most of our branches are place based. So our membership comes from within uh, the area where we're established. Other than Kale Mayali, your membership spans across all islands and even abroad. So they have members from all over the place. We have the whole branch, Kale Mayali, Anahola from Kauai, Hilo, Waimea, Las Vegas, and as well as Puna. So welcome Puna to the Hawaiian Patriot League, they're our newest branch. So we hope to build up to 59 or more in the future. And the reason we want more branches is for every community is unique. So we need the community to meet and discuss between themselves what issues they have and then they can bring that to the table. So we unify all these different communities and everybody can support each other and it gives us a lot more power. See how strong that power is? Yes, sir. Uh, let me interrupt and, and ask you about number six, Las Vegas. Um, can you talk to the, to the Las Vegas? Uh, yes. For, uh, well, Las Vegas is, some people consider it the ninth Hawaiian Island, but there's so many Hawaiian that live there. But they can participate in the Hawaiian League process. But like I said earlier, if we get into a restoration of our government process, we won't be able to vote unless they meet the residency requirements. But they can participate in supporting the process. And uh, Las Vegas is the home of our recording secretary, Chiel Kani Marcial, who's done the majority of research to help us get the architecture restored. And he's a registered parliamentarian, and what do they call it? ADD or what, something like that? I guess. HD. HD. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, a stickler for detail. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the Hilo branch the one across from the Army Surplus store? Uh, no, it doesn't have an actual physical location. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I think that's a uh, Hobby Hobby. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they, they're doing their own thing. And I would encourage Tommy Hobby to also start their own branch. But they have, have a lot of followers. And yeah, and the, yeah. the Puna guy is still in jail, I think. Yeah. Jean? I'm not, not sure who, who, who's the who. Jean. Jean Tomashiro. Oh, Jean. 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 No, I'm oh, I just saw an email from him I'll a couple days ago. He got it. Yeah. But Jean, Jean is fighting, fighting a good fight under common law. <laughs> it, it's fully support, but the United States, unfortunately, does not want to recognize that. And, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, there's been arguments that the United States is an unlawful occupation. And then the local judiciary, they refer back to the Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court had determined that the state of Hawaii is a lawful entity. 
but of course, if a murderer was able to judge himself, he would say he's innocent, <laughs> right? Well, so, what's the difference if the Supreme Court ruled that? Uh, if they so confident, why don't we step into the international court where this decision should be determined and not taking their own decision? But I wish Gene all the best of luck. He's a very good friend, and I know he. He's a real active guy out there, push, pushing the elbow as much as he can, risking his uh, well-being, and uh, you got to give the guy credit. So, a lot of Kanaka Maori is not even ready to go as far as Gene is going. So, he believes strongly in what he's doing, and I, I support what he's doing. Hey, the Central Valley Officer, we look forward to the league's continued growth to re-establish the league. And, organized force for Hawaii Kingdom Justice that it once was. Uh, to continue the status quo is not, in my opinion, uh, not an option, unless we're happy the way things are. Well, let me ask you, are, are we happy with the way things are? No. <laughs> if we were, we wouldn't be here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so we need, we need something to change, and I think unifying and organizing the people is the best weapon we have. And the United States loves where we are now and where we've been for the past century. Fragmented and unorganized. You can destroy any enemy that is fragmented and disorganized. And that's where they've kept us and I don't know what's wrong with us. We keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Some people say that's a sign of insanity. If it's true, I, I, I'm guilty. <laughs> uh, we're asking that uh, everyone be a part of the change we need during a, a branch near you today or start a new branch. Since we only have seven branches, there's a lot of areas that need new branches to be uh, created. And we're there to help. So on our website, uh, you can go through all of our documenting and things, there's a process to become chartered. So you can't just create a branch and then call yourself a Hawaiian teacher and you branch. You need to be chartered and approved by uh, during convention is usually how it's done or by a meeting of the central body officers. And we meet through video conferencing because we live uh, scattered all over the creation and video conferencing has worked uh, very well for us. We had a, a few hiccups here and there where we did test uh, product, uh, the, the equipment and then we had one group, group of, a large group of people in one room and there was a lot of feedback going on and we had to terminate that and everything. So we're kind of getting that a little bit more polished now and it's working very well. And, uh, you know, some people are not. Uh, comfortable with becoming officers in a branch, and that's okay. Uh, if you are part, part of it, share your concerns, if you have solutions, share the solutions, but it's all a part of the people. Do you have a question, please? Somebody will ask a question. Hello, somebody What is your position on voting in an occupied well, uh, personally, I don't, I don't think we should be voting in the process because we are uh, a very small block of voters because so many uh, refuse or boycott their vote. But you know, if, if we unify the people and organize the people, we could take over the existing governmental process. But I think we make up the majority. and. When it comes to that point, I wouldn't mind giving it a try. But other than that, right now, we're on the minority side, so I think it's kind of a waste of time. But that's just my opinion. Other people think differently. And, uh, you know, kind of view it as a weapon. That's a weapon that we use. Unfortunately, we're just not very proficient at using that weapon yet because we're so fragmented and so few of us are willing to actually participate in that process. And then there's some claim that you're uh, lending validity to the occupying government by voting in their 
process, mm -hmm. which I think is not a valid argument. So it is arguments on both sides that can so far and oppose. <laughs> so I don't know if that's an answer you before, but that's my answer. Um, yeah, okay. Membership of the league. Membership of the league is open to any Hawaiian Kingdom patriot or supporter for justice for the Hawaiian Kingdom. Regardless of race <coughs> or affiliation, if you belong to another group or, or not, it doesn't really matter. So it's just uh, bringing people together to support each other. So if your branch has an uh, uh, issue that is for common benefit of the whole, everyone can get behind that. So rather than your small group standing alone, you'll have the whole Hawaii Baker lead behind you in certain issues. But it must be in the best interest of the whole and not just your particular group. <coughs> Uh, so, like uh, our branch, our Wemia branch, uh, we have two vice presidents. Vice president, uh, uh, the first vice president is uh, Kainoa Stafford, the Hawaiian, and the second vice president in our bylaws allows for non non Hawaiian, non Kanakamori to serve in that position because we need leaders not only from uh, Hawaii regardless of race or Kanaka Moli, but we need non-Hawaiians involved in leadership position too. Because they can bring the concerns of the people that are not Hawaiians or Kanaka Moli into the discussion. So in the future I expect us all to be living together on the same same island. So we need to take care of all the people and not just a particular class of people. And there's so many changes. I would love to see the island. Like uh, you can only own a residence here if it's your primary residence. No vacation homes or anything like that. Well, there's a lot of people, well, people living in the bushes. Nothing wrong with that. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, prior to the invasion, there was no such thing as houseless people. Everybody had a place to stay. So I think we need to. Uh, unify and organize it and get busy and, and fix it. Uh, we're not going to be fixing it by continuing doing the same thing we're doing over and over and over. And finally... Okay, if I could add something. Yeah. I think it's points like you just raised there. Uh, specific things that's going to enliven people. You know, uh, the, the mechanics and the, the structure is important. But unless you have one of those unifying points, a vision that can excite people, well, to me that's key. So like, like your thing, the housing issue, a primary residence, ownership of a primary residence, this vacation rental thing is killing a while. Right? Mm -hmm. And I raised earlier about, you know, here we just raised the GE tax, which hurts the ordinary people. And I know there's vacation homes in Pukio, second, fourth, fifth, sixth vacation homes in the tens of millions of dollars that are being taxed far below their proper value. Mm -hmm. So they're shafting the county in terms of property taxes in these luxury homes. So I'm trying to think of what excites people and can unify a large number of people. Yeah. If you look at uh, the TMT on Malachia, that unifies a lot of people. Uh, I made a lot of friends and, and contact because of being activated in that and that some people have common interest in, in something. And I think we all have a common interest in improving our quality of life here in this place we call home. Regardless of who we are, where we live, what our income is, I think everybody is looking forward to a better Hawaii. It's getting worse. We all know that. Cost of living is going up. We can afford less and less as time goes on. The food they sell in the stores and stuff are becoming less and less healthy. There's so, so many issues that need to be addressed. And I see unification of the people as just the start of a larger process. So we, we have committees and things in the Hawaii Kitari League, established committees, and we can create new committees where needed, where people with particular expertise or interest in a particular area, they can work in the committee. 
rather than what a lot of us used to do in years gone by is trying to address all of the different issues rather than focusing on a specific issue. When you try to address too many things, it's like juggling too many balls and you end up dropping all the balls uh, rather than focusing on something specific and succeeding. And that's how the few successes I found uh, came about by my focusing on that one issue and not getting distracted by all the other things. Although I first heard about a lot of other things going on, I knew that needed specific focus and never give it up. Uh, I want to say mahalo to Kyo Kali Marcial again for Las Vegas. Pelikikana, uh, French Pelikikana, President. He's a registered parliamentarian and he serves as the recording secretary for us. Uh, he does our website, uh, he sets up our uh, Google Docs accounts and everything. He creates a lot of the draft documents for us. He does uh, the work of 10 people and he's still going, going to school. Uh, trying to increase his uh, chances for a better economic future for himself and his family. So he, he's been contributing hugely to the Hawaii State Drug League and I, I can't find the words uh, enough to send him uh, how much I thank him and appreciate his uh, uh, contribution. And I'd also like to mahalo Leilani Lindy Kaapuli for serving as our first electric Canada for President elect and to her loving husband Kim for his support. They're both wonderful people. And if you don't know them, I hope you get to meet them one day. If you live in the Hilo area, go ahead and join their branch. So a lot of the branches have a small membership uh, fee of uh, most of them are $20. And I believe our one way branch is the only uh, branch that requires no no fund. I, I don't want even five dollars to stand in the way of somebody becoming a part of this. <laughs> and so we, we do fundraising and whatever we need to do. And basically me, Taiwan and PE uh, do whatever we can to raise funds to uh, keep our bread afloat. And we're willing to accept donations, but we never did that for maybe one day. But so I think uh, if we want to change the future of this place and our lives, the lives of our children, grandchildren and stuff. We need to come together as, as one and organize and figure out how we're going to fight this battle. A, you might not realize it, but it's a battle, it's a war we're in. So the United States is destroying us. They're running us over. They were slaves to them. They've created a economic system where we busy working all the time and we get tired so we want some entertainment so we're not paying attention to what they're doing to us. A lot of people are just totally in the blind of what's going on. So we need to get away from that and I think you will find that organizing the people is one way to go about it. So on behalf of Ka'aha Hui Hawaii Aloha Aina and mahalo to all of you. And are there any other questions on you? Questions? Um, yeah. um, I, I don't know if I missed it, but how long do you have to be resident before you can join? Uh, there's no residency requirement for joining the Hawaiian Patriotic League. Oh. Uh, there is a residency requirement uh, for the restoration of the government to be a voter, you need to have a one year minimum residency, I think. But for the league, there's no, no restrictions on residency or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Any other questions? Oh. Uh, what about aligning with other indigenous movements and, and nations that have uh, an indigenous um, um, government? You know, so that, because I don't see any real um, hope in the United Nations solving, you know, the, the issue because they're controlled by, by the big five, you know, so you have to, you know, to, 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 to get to, to break out into the bigger picture worldwide, you have to find people who, who are dealing with the same, same issues. Yeah, so I participated in uh, 
uh, Pacific Forum, uh, uh, civil society organization meetings prior to the Pacific Forum meeting. And uh, so I, I look at the Pacific as a blue continent, where all the Pacific Islands and coastal areas should be a part of the blue Pacific continent because uh, the ocean is where our resource base is actually under the water. So people look at us as just small land masses. We don't have precious metals and things like that in Hawaii. But the majority of our um, value, I think, is in the ocean. And we all have internationally recognized 200 mile economic exclusive zones where we can do a lot of economic activity out there. This uh, shipping, uh, international shipping through Hawaii, would bring in a lot of money. So we would be uh, less dependent on federal grants and all that kind of stuff. We would generate our own money. A lot of people are worried about the economy, but there are the economy of a society thing, but it's interviewed by Ehu Kekabu Cardwell on Free Hawaii, and he did a presentation on how much better Hawaii would be economically if the United States was gone. So a lot of people are worried about losing their social security, and I give them an example of uh, my work in construction, meeting a lot of uh, Filipinos that they came from friendly, they've retired, moved back to the Philippines, their checks are mailed to them in the Philippines. They're no longer American citizens, but Philippine mm -hmm. citizens, and they receive their checks. So Social Security is like a contract between you as an individual and the United States federal government. They owe you that money. So even if you're not an American citizen, they owe you that money because they got to pay you. So don't, don't worry about your Social Security. You, you pay for those benefits when you're entitled to that. But there's a... Uh, so many potential economic engines that can be created in Hawaii and not depending on the in-the-box stuff that's coming out of the United States. So, you know, we have a lot of brilliant minds here and you know, I don't think we need to be drilling in Mount Pele to get our uh, electricity. Place with uh, a lot of sunshine, so solar energy is good, we have wave energy and even tide energy we can develop our own electricity in so many different ways. I think many places on the planet are as in prime location for self-sufficiency of energy as Hawaii is. And I think we really need to get into uh, high portal or healthy food. So most of us are guilty of not eating very healthy food because of the rush, hustle, and bustle of the current lifestyle. We don't have time to get out there and grow all of our own food. Uh, a lot of us can, but a lot of us cannot. A lot of people don't have the land to do it. Uh, there's so many, so many girls out there. Yeah. There's a lot, lot that needs to be done, and I think uh, the only way we can get it done is together. So I don't think we'll remain fragmented. We just gotta continue deteriorating from what we are, and I just don't want to leave that kind of future to my more for us. I have couple of dozen grandchildren, and I don't want them living in the kind of world I'm living in today. And that's the reason I do this. And I apologize to my children for not being a great parent and spending all my time doing this, but I'm doing it for their children. And I hope you understand that. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question, but um, are we in the open forum already? Yep. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Pang. Uh, Pardon me? Okay. I'm so this sorry. This is my closing. Oh, it's sexy, so <laughs> practice it daily. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Pang, uh, what is the radius of the... Uh, um, um, okay. Yeah, the outside. outside. Okay. Airborne. If you study dust physics, there's different size of dust particles. The small stuff, it can go <clears throat> hundreds of miles in a couple of days, depending on the wind. When the U.S. accidentally blew up their own stockpile of DU in the Mideast, there was a pulse in the U.K. They detected it uh, in the U.K. in about six weeks. Now, normally, pesticides, maybe they'll deteriorate before they spread that far. But the radioactivity of DU, it, 
millions of years. Millions. Millions, okay, so it's forever. And all you count on is the dilution. But the different particle sizes, some will travel, suspend, never come down. Those you will inhale. Some will jump. It's called saltation, it means to jump. And if you think, ah, it jumps what, 20 miles? As soon as it impacts other particles, it will break into the suspendable stuff. And some will creep along the ground, impacting, and then some is repeatedly bombed. And 50% of that goes out to sun. So it will travel. Any question? <coughs> the whole island. Uh, like, yeah. And all the other islands. Where are the bombs falling? Are they, are they in the ocean or, not, or on land or both? Oh, man. Oh, right in the center of the island. They're actually Guapaloa. Guapaloa Guapaloa is, Guapaloa. is 133,000 acres. The base is bigger than the island of Guam. It's in the center of our island. Because when I was right outside at on um, what was it Saturday? I mean, of course, it was early in the morning, but I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything they, white stuff. They don't always, you know, let me know. I mean, it dropped from very, very high up also, like 30,000 feet. You can't even see the airplane. Right. Right. You know, and very few people realize that planes from Louisiana, Missouri, and Guam fly here nonstop and bomb for Okaloa and return to those bases without ever touching down the fuel in the air. The strategic bombers, B-1, B-52, B-2 bombers. If you're speaking directly about uh, RIMPAC, uh, the bombing is occurring on land and sea. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they have uh, target vessels out there, they're bombing those target vessels, submarines blowing up uh, the trash ships and things like that. So bombing is happening on the land and the sea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, we may run out of time, but I just wanted you to uh, to uh, report to the group that the last time we went up there and demonstrated in front of the PTA, the new base commander came out and greeted us, so I thought that was good for everybody to know. Yeah, every two years they move out the existing commander bringing a new one. The unusual thing about this new commander He's born and raised on a wall. He's a Filipino guy, Mochi, West Point grad, lieutenant commander. But he and his wife is Hawaiian. And uh, we have presented a list of over 100 signatures of our statement that the money, instead of going to RIMPAC bombing, should be used for lava relief. We presented those petitions. But he came out and we talked for probably a half an hour. And uh, the outcome of it was it would be an opportunity for us to want to the base to talk story more, that he, at least he seemed to be open uh, to that kind of uh, dialogue, you know, so I think it's a positive sign, but again, uh, uh, the squeeze is going to come down on him, the more he becomes open to us, uh, the squeeze will come down, uh, but at least we should move on that in a positive way, you know, uh, so we're trying to set that up, because we've been pushing for years access to Puakaloa, at a minimum to do uh, opening and closing Makahiki ceremony that Ahu has been built there on Kuwakawa. But uh, I wanna, one thing uh, just I want to mention is don't forget this Wednesday, uh, 3 to 4.30 at the airport intersection if you can pass the word. I think we need to stand up, keep these issues out there, because uh, they get lost otherwise. No, but uh, the other part, his, uh, his partner is Hawaiian. Yeah. And she is a cousin of Keanu Sai and Ku Kahakalao, who was there demonstrating with us. And when she heard that Ku was there earlier, she said, oh, I was trying to talk to her last night. And they were planning to meet Keanu as a couple next day. So I think it's, a, a, you know, it's interesting that there is this Hawaiian connection, not just any Hawaiian, but Hawaiians who are actively pushing for sovereignty and, uh, and independence. The unfortunate thing is that although he may be the commander of the Pohakaloa military installation, the excuse they usually use is those hard 
issues like the occupation is above their pay grade. So we can't really address the concern we have, but perhaps access to some of the cultural sites and things we may be able to help us with. So we can't get our hopes up too high by having some friendly in certain positions because we can only make decisions up to a certain level. So, but like uh, Wednesday is uh, the airport here. Wednesday at the Hilo Airport, yeah. I'm sorry. So, like, imagine something uh, like what gym guys have been doing, ongoing, holding signs and things like that, and they have tens of people, maybe occasionally hundreds of people. Imagine if we have tens of thousands of people on there. So, when you have that many people on there, the politicians <coughs> take notice because you see a lot, of, a lot of those people probably vote. I need to start helping them out. So we need to start small like that, start uh, influencing the uh, occupying government, and then perhaps taking it over or taking some more drastic uh, action. But I think we need to unify. Uh, there is power in numbers, you can organize those numbers. And that's basically the military strategy. You want to build up a lot of uh, military troops and organize them and train them and everything in specific tactics and things. So we have special forces here and there, and we need to do that same thing. There's nothing bad about being uh, unified and organized. Nothing bad at all. But the bad thing is how you use that power. That's where the evil comes in. You misuse it for bad things, hurting people, that's where they will come in. It's not so much a question as I just wanted to share with you as you were speaking about unifying within the Pacific. Um, my grandson got married in North Pole Island last December, and I, we were there as a family. And I was wearing the Queen's T-shirt. And there was an open market, and my daughter was talking to the man who was a vendor, and his wife was sitting on the side of the truck, and there was fruits and vegetables, and I didn't know whether this thing was a fruit or a vegetable. <coughs> I go over to her, and I said, you know, what is this? And she said, where are you from? You don't talk like us. And I said, oh, for what? And I had a jacket on. And so she says, she jumps up and she says, oh, what? You're suffering like, you're suffering much longer than we. And I said, what do you mean? She said, Australia has taken them over. Yeah. And they're fighting for their rights because Queen Victoria gave them the island. Yeah. And, and those documents have disappeared. <laughs> so, I, so I'd open up my shirt and I tell her about our queen. I give her the whole spiel, mm -hmm. and then she says, "Would you mind talking to Albert Buffett? He's the president of the uh, Council of Elders." I said, "No, I'd be happy to." So she makes the call. I get the phone, and she's already blabbed all what I told her. And he he says, "Would you meet with me?" I said, "Oh, sure." So he picks me up the next morning. Takes me up to his house and he has this huge acreage. It's beautiful the island. It reminded me of us. Yeah. Keys in the cars, don't lock their doors, all of that. So anyway, we drive into his place, it's an Intel older place, but I've never in my whole life seen a plumeria tree as big as this one. It was a hundred plus years old. And it was a monkey man flower set in yellow was the plate outside. And I said, wow, I never saw a tree this big. He said, I said, how do you pick the flowers? Because it was full. He said, oh, we just shake the tree. Not a problem. I said, my grandson's getting married here. Oh, you can have all the flowers you want. So we made this connection. What was very interesting is what they were, just like what you said, it's in numbers that make a difference. And what they have been trying to do is unify all the small islands, and they tried to get Bumpy to be involved 
and becoming coming under their umbrella. I, I can't remember how many islands have permitted. Not many, but they've started this process. And they've so that's who they're trying to get Hawaii to become a part of this unifying of the islands. So they in their way they have that same picture of not having a voice because they don't have enough numbers. Yeah. And yet they've got, they have this organized plan and they're trying to reach out. They have an attorney who is working with them who has done, really backs what they're doing now. And he lives in New Zealand. So New Zealand has become a part of that. I've participated in a lot of uh, civil society uh, forums with people from various islands, in Tonga, Samoa, different places, Aotearoa, and unfortunately a lot of the civil society organizations are funded by the government. So they don't really represent the interests of the people, but what the government wants them to represent. So, we need to stay away from any government uh, influence, any government funding, anything like that. So, it needs to be truly grassroots, where you're not owing favor to anybody but yourself. So, I think that's the only way we can move forward. Uh, different people have different ideas. And I think we need to fix our problem here before we can go out and join other people. And we need to focus on our problem. We don't want to get distracted by other people's problems. But we can't help ourselves, so how are we supposed to help somebody else? So if we can help ourselves, get ourselves situated, to be in a much stronger position to assist other people to get what they need. But until we get ourselves straight, I don't think it will be much help to anybody. Uh, people need to actually be doing something, like just a name on a piece of paper you're a member of the group, and you're not doing anything to support it. If you're going to join a group, you need to commit to providing some kind of support to the group, rather than just having a name on a piece of paper. And I've, I've known Bumpy for many years, and we worked together as teenagers at the Olobana Golf Course, building a, a concrete path for the golf cart. Mm -hmm. I've kind of seen him grow up over the years. Uh, I don't agree with everything he's done, but I'm happy for some of the people that have benefited from some of his work. And like the people in uh, I believe it was Waianae, they were having some hard times, so they created that pool. No, Waianae mm -hmm. doesn't down at the beach and stuff like that. And I thought Buffy was going to offer them to come to his place, but he offered the idea that they create something like you. Mm -hmm. Which I guess, I guess is a good second offer. Well, see, he didn't respond to this buffet yeah. at all. And so that's how, how from he asked, you know. Yeah. So he just shared that with me. And I knew why, because just like what you're saying, his whole uh, focus is only on what he has. Yeah. You see. Uh, it's kind of human nature being uh, interested in, in getting your group or your family in a better condition. So I kind of blame Bumpy for doing no, no, that. Not at all. Uh, he seems to be looking more into the economy kind of stuff. So he was, uh, the Bank of America had promised some funds and he was upset that some other Hawaiian organization got control of those funds. <laughs> And then I think he started up the Aloha coin, like a cryptocurrency or something like that. So he's looking at the financial end, and I don't, I don't really see any problem with that. But we need to address many different things, including the economy. So that's one of the things people are most afraid of is the, the unknown. What's going to happen with the economy and all that? But, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Um, and so I wanted to just say, um, even when the indigenous people working in the United Nations mm -hmm. met with the current islanders also. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of them was uh, from Hawaii. He was engaged to a pig farm islander. Mm -hmm. um, but what, why I'm speaking to that is because I feel like 
one of the things that colonization has done is made the peoples of the Pacific, who used to be the peoples of the whale, by the way, uh, feel separated. Um, and remember, Papua was linked to a uh, big ocean, right? We started to flip the language because they always refer to us as tiny islands in the middle of the ocean. We're, we're big ocean nations is what we need to start calling ourselves mm -hmm. because that's actually what we are. Yeah. And um, there's also, I just wanted to say, uh, I understand the, the concerns about the United Nations um, because certainly when you engage as an indigenous person there, it's very difficult and you're oppressed by the major Kansas states is what they're referred to. But the reason for going to the United Nations is to network with all of the indigenous people and also uh, because you need, that's the only place where you can gain sort of a consensus and uh, build universal ideas. Not the only place, but one of the places. And then this, the other kinds of conferences help build that. So, I, don't, I mean, we absolutely should go to the United Nations, in my opinion, because, not because we expect them to do something, but because we're doing it and they, they should be a part of it. Because we're actually progressive there. We're not going there, we're going there to move major things. So are the Maori, so are the Aboriginals, so are the Lakota. All these nations, they're, they're not going, they're, we're not going there to gain consent for who we are. Nobody needs to defend the kingdom, the kingdom exists. We don't need to take it into this court or that court or any court. We just need to start living it. And that's why proper guys are already invoking that. <coughs> and that's what we need to continue to do. But you do want to go to the United Nations to share your truth and your ideas and help to uh, bring that to a global you know, group of people listening. So I've been involved in uh, the United Nations effort, uh, yeah. particularly the Convention on Biological Diversity, yeah. trying to stem the loss of species from the planet. And uh, I was with, they call it the indigenous forum, they call all people of color into one group. And it was very insulting when I first went in into my first meeting. We were put in the back of the room, reminded me of back during the days of slavery and the years that followed when you always make your way to the back of the bus. Even uh, all the NGOs and everything were in the front of us. It was like we, we were not a factor in there. But uh, I, was, I was the chair of this. Uh, Protected areas beyond national jurisdictions, which is basically international waters. And all these countries were kind of jockeying back and forth, trying to pick tiny little spots in international waters to protect. So I asked my group, let's come up with a strong recommendation, and they agreed. So I stood up, presented the recommendation from the Indigenous Forum was to establish all international waters as a global marine protected, wa uh, protected area with all of the countries contributing towards surveillance and enforcement of that. But because so many countries are out there ripping the ocean, it's like the Wild Wild West or the international ocean. People are ripping the marine resources and everything, and that's why uh, fish like tuna and stuff are in such a decline, the price is skyrocketing. Local fishers have a hard time catching them nowadays and just running out. There's a lot of perseverance, long land, and things just harvesting tons and tons. I went to American Samoa and visited the American Percy three W and talked with one of the captains and uh, he explained to me that it takes them about two weeks. They leave uh, Palo Palo and take them about two weeks to reach the fishing ground. They fish uh, on the equator 10 degrees either side in that region. It's where the north and south currents converge and there's a lot of nutrients and things that pile up there and they said when you get to the area there's nothing but fish everywhere and the person that you go out and they just surround us full of fish sometimes the fish are too small you get them next to the boat and they're all compacted you kill maybe half the school of fish mm -hmm. and they kill one or two small they let them walk and they surround another school or they're too big to kill half of the fish they let them walk and that was becoming just a big waste 
And fortunately, some environmental organizations stepped forward and filed some lawsuits and stuff. So now they're required to put a helicopter on all of the boats. And they go up and they, they look at the fish before they surround the fish. And so the, the cannery that uh, purchased those fish, they need fish between 40 and 80 pounds. That's what the processing machinery can handle. So they need to target that place specifically. But those boats, they go, take them two weeks to get to the fishing grounds. They fish for as little as two days. They get two million pounds of fish on a boat, and they go all the way back to American Samoa, and they create canned tuna. If you ever saw what the fish look like coming out of the hole of those fish, you'll probably never eat canned tuna again. They don't use ice. It's uh, refrigerated ocean water, chilled seawater. And they strap them all, they tie them all with the tail together on a big bunch of them and lift them up with the crane. And they're all green, purple, dripping slime. Terrible. You probably would never eat that fish. And the smell is so terrible that people in America come along with refuse to work Smith Cannery to make better money on uh, welfare. So a lot of it call it welfare. So they import the labor from Tonga and Western Samoa to work in the cannery. And there was so much fish coming in, there was a, a glut on fish that a Russian ship was there, probably a thousand foot long. There was four long lines, uh, four perceivers, two on each side, 24 hours a day for a five day dollar there, just unloading fish 24 hours a day into that Russian ship because they didn't have the capacity to process, process the fish in the American Samoa. So I asked the uh, captain, if there's a worldwide glut on canned tuna, why are you guys ca still catching the tuna? The United States government, they gave us a mortgage on our boat, so we need to pay that mortgage or they're going to confiscate the boat and the mm -hmm. But the American government has invested heavily into uh, the United States fisheries, and that's why a lot of this overfishing is forced to occur. And I don't want to lose the boat, they have too much invested in it. So even if the price is way down for the fish, uh, they get a dollar a pound for the fish. They, they, they kind of force my economic to continue fishing. Yeah, I'd like to wrap this up in a few minutes. So we have maybe one more question? Yes. Uh, and perhaps you already have an answer for this. Getting back to rain packaging, this occurs every two years. Uh, do we have monitors up there who are monitoring both air a wind direction and also amount of the uh, the uh, EU oxides that are in the air. In other words, do we have any type of warning system? I used to work for the National Park Service as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and air monitoring and air direction were always part of our daily operation. And I just wondered, has anything been implemented so that a warning system can be at least given that levels are low, moderate, or high? Uh, for the population, especially taking into account wind direction and amount of the air. I just wonder if any of that had ever been done. and then I'll put it to past several years, we have been uh, urging the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the regulatory agency for uh, source material, to require air monitoring for nuclear uranium. And they're basically advocates for the military's uh, views. Uh, not required, depleted uranium is not for migrating off the base, uh, depleted uranium is not dangerous, ignoring uh, the fact of the difference between depleted uranium oxide and depleted uranium. So we got nowhere with the Federal Regulatory Agency. I had scheduled a meeting with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to meet with us and on May 30th. Uh, they subsequently canceled the meeting at the last minute and we have yet to uh, have a meeting rescheduled. Because the monitoring equipment is actually not that great of an expense. For $30,000, we could get adequate equipment to monitor for uh, the state of the uranium oxide from from Baltimore. And you know, that's definitely one of those healthy things that the military has. And their refusal not to do conduct their monitoring tells me they know it's happening. So, if it wasn't happening, they would surely, quickly, voluntarily do all the monitoring we wanted, but they haven't. Let me add one thing so your information. I see there's a count of people here. We discovered the depleted uranium up there in May of 2007. In July of 2008, 
We've got resolution 639-08 passed the county council by a vote of eight to one. Call for eight actions. And the first action was stopping all live fire until there's a complete assessment of the depleted uranium up there and cleanup. And the seven other actions call for such things as monitoring and a committee, including with Dr. Pang on it, to be a resource person for the county. All of those eight action plans have been completely ignored by the U.S. military. Our congressional delegates have done nothing. Our state people have done nothing. Everybody's subservient to the military. It was great that the county council passed that resolution, but there's been no follow-up. So there's a job for you. Follow-up on 639-08. Well, right now, right now we have, for the last four months, almost four months, you know, uh, we're not very station at the base of uh, uh, Monica. And, it, you know, they've been there now, well, it's been a little over 100 days. And it just seems like if we could get funding through, that would be an excellent location. I gave them a monitor to use. Well, I mean, just to, to actually notify the public. In other words, from what you said, you know, early on about at least letting the public know. I know in cases, at least on the continental U.S., I mean, I come from the desert southwest there where they used to do above ground nuclear testing. Uh, when we look at, you know, wind patterns there, but my point is, is even when they have areas that have high air pollution, there's monitoring that goes out and warns different people about that. It seems like in this case, it takes it even beyond. Since we started asking for monitoring, you saw in my presentation, 2012, 2015, we've got 155 United Nations states. Two bills, right? One, declaration that it's weapon of mass destruction. Wow. Because all the use in the Balkans and the Mideast, and here we are doing it, whatever. Then the second bill was those nations that use it or don't have a problem should help the nations. Maybe that's why. If they're not going to help the U.S., then the U.S. is not going to help us. We should ask the international people. The international people, yeah, the United Nations, I keep making fun. They urge and they ask and they petition. But they're getting very, very close to the issues. They say the uncertainty is huge. Yes. They will follow precautionary principle, yes. And so what's with the bombing? I doubt that they use DU here, but they're blowing up the DU remnants. And to me, this reeks of human experimentation without informed consent. They're not even fighting a war. But when they declare internationally, Iraq bans it. And don't forget, one of the codes, the Nuremberg Code, besides informed consent, is to bring out all the animal studies. What were the animal studies? The rats, you use alpha particles on them. Their offspring, and their offspring are never contaminated, but they have leukemia, they have birth defects. And that's why it's a weapon of mass destruction, especially in Iraq and the Balkans. Here, I don't know what we're doing. That's why it's an experimentation. I would appeal to the international agencies. They floated a bill to help us. Now, the U.S. are going to say, no, uh, we're not letting you do it, and we're not letting the international agencies help you. Wow. That's pretty bad. Let's thank uh, Aloha, Lauren, and Paka for being here. <laughs> website. Take leaflets, they're at the end of the table there. All the wine and dog away. Well, I say don't give up on the United Nations. The United States is a powerful, never enduring government. They're losing power as time goes on. It's pissing off a lot of other countries, so I believe one day the other countries are going to unify and organize. Mark my word.